Hey there, friends. Welcome to the Being Brown and Bold podcast. I'm your host, Jess Thomas. We are so glad that you are joining us for all of our amazing conversations about stepping out of our comfort zone, being bold, and taking chances. Today, I get to chat with Simon Majumdar. He is a world-renowned broadcaster, food writer, speaker, author, and cook. I mean, the list goes on and on. And I love <laughs> what his mission is to go everywhere, to eat everything, and now to meet everyone. So you get to meet him. He, his journey has taken him to all 50 states and to dozens of countries around the world. He was a restaurant cr critic for Time Out Los Angeles. He's written hundreds of articles all over the internet and many publications, as well as three books, Eat My Globe, Eat for Britain, and Fed White and Blue. And you have most likely seen him on Food Network. He's been on every show from Guy Fieri's Tournament of Champions, Guy's Grocery Games, Iron Chef America, Cutthroat Kitchen, like you've definitely seen him. Um, so if you have not yet, you need to check out his podcast, which is a history podcast on food called Eat My Globe, Things You Didn't Know That You Didn't Know About Food. So we are so excited to have you here on the podcast today, Simon. Thank you, Jesse. It was, uh, it's so pleased to be able to, you know, come and speak to you about this because, um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm part, part Indian and part Welsh. So to be able to come on and talk with you, who's got some of the um, you know, things that I have in my life as well is really, really pleasing. So thank you. For, thank you very, very much. Well, we are glad to have you. So like, let's start there. Your name. Tell us about your name, how to properly pronounce it, what it means, <laughs> how you got it. Well, it's a name from Calcutta or from that area. So it's a Bangladeshi name because it also goes into uh, Bangladesh itself that used to be part of India although uh, the Muslim part of their they call it Mazumda and then in uh, Bengal they call it or uh, my part of Bengal or Calcutta they call it Majumda oh. so it's a Bengali name it, apparently and I've never got this right it means tax collector which is slightly <laughs> frightening but there you go um and so my uh, my father and my grandfather and all the way through in the male thing of the family there they used uh, they were doctors so they've go doctors all the way back so that's where the name comes from from my father Majumda. well that's your name what does it mean to be some there's, there's a lot of things that it takes to be anybody anybody you know i'm married to a wonderful woman who's uh experiences you know she's filipino uh, but now she's you know she's an la person and she's very la ite as it were and so she exp you know gives me that because now i live in la you know i i only moved over from london about uh 15 years ago even le slightly less and so she gives me uh, I only have that because in London I was a Londoner. I was, I not that I was in London forever, but I moved down when I was eighteen. Uh, so I think of London as even now I think of it as my home. Um, I think of uh, the fact that we all we travel, and by we travel I mean everywhere. So we go. Last year we went to Romania and Bulgaria, and that's going to be you know that's very different for some people. So <clears throat> that's our travel. So I have the travel side of it. You know, I'm I'm a book writer. I'm a, all these things that you were talking about earlier. <clears throat> but I cook very British food. I cook um, and British Indian food. So I cook um, chicken tikka masala, which I I keep describing to everyone. It's not been, it's not an Indian dish, and they're all like very, but it's on every Indian menu here in the US. Everyone. Uh, but it's a British dish, and I go and I tell everyone about that uh, far too late. But I love that, and I love the British Indian dishes, and I love the Indian dishes, the, you know, the Vindaloos and all of that. How did the Indian heritage and the Welsh heritage, th these cultures, inform your current life and work? Or, like, what was it even growing up? Did you feel like you were really Indian? Because I know lots of people who are bicultural sometimes feel this pressure that they have to choose a side, they're not really sure. 
Um, yeah, how was it for you? <laughs> well, I have to say, back in the 60s, 70s, when I really grew up in Yorkshire, Rotherham, it was a great town. It was a mining steel town. It was people were very blunt, shall I say, of what they thought of you. There were very few uh, Indian people. They were brought in. So my father went in to become, he went to Rotherham because no one else in the uh, UK, or certainly not in the south of the UK, where he first arrived, would offer him a job. So we went up to this small town, or relatively small, because no one would offer him a job elsewhere, but he was given a job as the consultant surgeon. So he went in and then he brought over a few people from uh, Calcutta who were great doctors and he, he got them into various places. And that was, you know, it was good. It was interesting because when I went to Rotherham, people used to call me all sorts of names, but it wasn't in a bad way. It's they just didn't know anything else to call you. Um, Later, I moved you know, to London when I was 18 uh, to study at seminary. And that's when I got called it the same word, but it was really different. That's when I got really caught out by it because I was only 18. I hadn't left the UK and uh, sorry, left uh, my own town. I, you know, I went to visit my grandparents, my Welsh grandparents who lived in London at this point. So I went to see them. But all the people there would call me this name. And at the same uh, time, I, it felt so different. Um, but what was interesting with our family was my Welsh mother had married my Indian father. My father was, you know, very brown skinned, very. But my Welsh grandparents never, ever, ever had a problem with him. It was ne which I found really difficult. Well, not really difficult, rather, really. Um, that was a, a thing that I found quite challenging as I got older, because uh, as I went around the world, when I went up to you know, Scotland and all these places, people used to have. And so when we went there together with my grandparents and my parents, they never used to be allowed to stay at hotels. They never used to be allowed to, you know, so um, this was in the 60s and early 70s. And so um, it was it was a really strange period for me. Um, and even now, I have to say, even now, when I uh, first came over to the US, I, you know, if you go outside you know, the places where, you know, it's accepted, I find even now there's some places where it's not accepted. And uh, even in the UK, I get called, uh, yeah, I won't name the names, but it's a really you know, it happens. And so it's still, you know, it's still very difficult to describe who you are. When I was up in Rotherham, I would get called something very, um, you know, and but it was the same words that they used in the South. But in the South, at that point, you knew it came from hatred. In the North, you didn't. England and, and all of the, as having a lot of, um, you know, the, the, just as there are here, the, we're getting a lot of people giving us a hard time mm. um, because of, you know, because we're immigrants. And I'm going, well, I was born here. <laughs> I was, you know, I've lived here most of my life and all of that. Um, but, you know, I'm old enough to be, you know, I'm nearly 60, so I'm old enough to be able to deal with it all now. But mm. it was hard. When you were little what did you imagine your life would be like as an adult? Not maybe vocation, but just in general, what did you feel like your life would be? You know, when I grew up, this is what my life would look like. I was going to be in a seminary, even from when I was oh, six or seven. And I used to go, my mother would take me to uh, the Anglican, uh, you know, church. So uh, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be an Anglican minister. And I. this is going to be my life. And, uh, you know, you can get married and all of this stuff. So, you know, it's not, not like the Roman Catholic, but it's very what we call high church. Anyway, I, I wanted to do that. I went to seminary. I did four years of a course. I did everything like that. 
and then about a third the way through you know the the vicars as they were you know uh, got together and said by the way we don't think you're going to be a priest and i was like oh okay then um i i did the course i love that course i was um, and i still kind of read about it and i i love all that and i had to i remember the dean at the time is telling me, yeah, this isn't going to be your ministry. You need to go and find something else, which I did. I, I then went on to become a book publisher, which I loved. I loved, I loved. And I started publishing cookbooks and I published all kinds of books. And uh, I worked for Penguin. I started as a rep, which was great. I only had a, a small amount of shops in the centre of London, and I'd go around and have lunch with them every day. It was it was lovely. I went to Orion, which was another famous publisher, and then I went to this very tiny um, publisher, which was great too for a while. And then I suddenly I got so depressed by you know my mother had died and all of these things had happened. And I ended up um, kind of getting tired, really. And I and I remember being at home, and, and this sounds really uh, bad, but I want I wanted to jump off the balcony of this thing, of this you know beautiful flat I had beautiful flat. Well, I, we still have it now, and I still remember in the base of this uh, the uh, you know there was a, a cemetery and. John Bunyan was buried there, who wrote uh, Pilgrim's Progress, and Rob, uh, Daniel Defoe and William Blake. It was, it's, you know, it's closed now. It's a cemetery, but you can just walk to it. And I always thought if I throw myself in from my thing into the cemetery, at least there won't be any middleman. I still remember this. Um, but that's when I found um, this book that I'd done when I'd done a Tony Robbins course on it. And... Um, uh, it was had loads of areas in it I had to write about, but one of them was goals. And at the bottom of this, I'd written go everywhere, eat everything, which I don't even remember writing. And that was the beginning of my journey uh, when I you know, agreed with the person of the company that I should leave. And she, she was a really gracious woman. But anyway, um, I went out there and I still remember I wrote to uh, Anthony Bourdain who was someone I'd come in touch with over the years. He sent me a quote and he did. Uh, he told me some places to go. He said, I think you should write a book. And I decided to do that. And that's really when I got into writing. And then when I came over here in 2008, I actually met, uh, my, I met my wife in Brazil and then I met her when she was over here in LA. And that's how we, we got married, which I was never going to do, but... When you see her, she's uh, remarkably lovely. And so I went in to see the people at Food Network. I don't know why, because I wasn't anyone, but they invited me in to go and meet with them. And that was the beginning of my journey in, in the Food Network. If you'd have told me when I was going to be in seminary that I was going to be working on the Food Network in another country, which I never thought I would do because I love love, but here I am. So again, what I always say to anybody that your journey is you think you're going to be one thing and I've got four or five different careers in my past I had no idea so I don't think people ever have an idea of what they're going to do which is I think is just great I mean you tell me were you ever going to do a podcast Nope. <laughs> yeah and you just go or I wasn't going to do a podcast but I wanted to do it because nobody ever ever talks about the history of food i talk about the history of fish and chips i talk about the history of whatever we've done nearly 100 episodes now and um i think i'm doing this for me <laughs> i'm doing it because i want to do it yeah. and that's really it so by you know all of these things i've done it's taken me to this point and who knows where it will take me in the future you know who knows yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's that is a lot. I was gonna say getting, I don't know, dismissed at seminary. Like that must have been devastating because this was the career path you were going on. How did that affect you, I guess, spiritually to, you know, here's something that you're working towards. And if you wanted to go into the ministry since six, I don't know. That I feel like that would be job. You know, I was yeah, I was a little bit like jarred by it, but I soon actually got over that and to be honest, um, the dean actually said to me when I, he said, this isn't going to be your ministry. 
and he said your ministry will be somewhere else and I, I have no idea whether he had any idea what I was going to be doing now but I do many many events for uh, people of faith whenever I do these events I always have a speech about it and when I do them I would say this is now you know, my ministry and cooking and demoing and things I always do that with a lot of faith and I said this is what I'm doing now I said who knows what I'll be doing in the future in a in a different way faith is still there for me it's still there so um I think that helps me it really does and you know maybe the the vicars they you know they have this committee and the uh, and a, a lot of them got together. They were very lovely about it. I mean, uh, I'm not saying they dragged me to the side and said, you, you, it helped me, I think. And they they said to me, this isn't going to work. Thank you for sharing all of that. I know that um, you talked about depression and, you know, that was a pivotal moment for you. But I know in a lot of South Asian cultures, especially now, there's a lot of conversation about taking care of your mental health, but there's still the stigma that if you are um, focusing on your depression or anxiety or anything like that, you just need to get over it because, you know, there's, yeah. and so I, I, but I'm hearing in the younger generations, there's a lot more attention being paid to that. How, how was it for you? Did you feel supported? Did you feel loved? Did you even feel safe? Like you could even talk about it back then. No, I mean, I I didn't because I was away, you know, at seminary and I was then was in publishing. And so um, I was married, but then that separate, I, we separated. And so I was on my own as well. And I, I kind of was just trying to deal with it myself. You know, I didn't deal with it too badly compared to some people, you know, not you didn't compared jump, to others. But that's good. I'm glad you didn't jump. And no, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't too. But I was, you know, I was going to jump, and it was because of, you know, my mother had passed away of leukemia, and that was really hard for me. Um, you know, my father was, you know, up in Rotherham, and I was down in London, so I didn't have chance to meet with him as so often. So I felt really just on my own. I was going into work, I was coming back, and then I was just watching television, and that's kind of how I dealt with it and that's how a lot of people dealt with it um and at the same time I'd left the church and I was feeling you know a bit you know, down about it and in England as well no one really talked about it we never ever ever really talked about it and even the day that I was going to throw myself off you know the balcony of this thing I was like Oh well, I, I I can deal with it. I mean, even if it is just jumping off the balcony, that's dealing with it. You know, it's whatever we're talking about, whatever you know, people worship or whatever. Um, I found it because I found that book, and at the back, uh, at the end of this thing, I said, "Go everywhere, eat everything." And I thought, oh, and I still remember. So I was eating this. We call it in our uh, house uh, life saving dal. That's what we call it, life-saving dal. And it was a red lentil dal. I don't put any paka on top of it. I, all I do is have it almost like a soup. But one of the things we do in our family, we cut up lemons really small and put them in the dal and eat that with it. And it's it's really delicious. It was just that bit of reading that. And that got me really ha happy almost and and I went and had my dal and rice, which is lovely. And then I was writing these uh, places in the world I could go. I hadn't traveled at that point to you know, many more countries. You know, my family lived in Spain, which is also people here. You know, go. I decided to go to all these countries. And it was on that country that I met my wife. It was all those, on that country that I moved over to the US. It was on that when I was doing a press, I did something. And the people from the Food Network were hearing me. And I, that's all, you know, how that happened. And so, you know, by feeling really depressed, you know, I got given that opportunity to, you know, go out and do something else, which, you know, I think you'll always get. You'll always get. 
So, oh. uh, so for me, it was it was a very interesting period of my time because I wasn't young. I was writing a food blog, one of the earliest food blogs of the time. I mean, there must have been about ten of us in the world, or so. I'm, I don't know that, but yeah, we were lucky at that point because we got taken up by the by the Guardian to write uh, to write or the you know Times to write because we were older and the writing we did was particularly well received. When you follow these paths that we talk about, um, I just think it, it takes you to amazing places. I think, you know, when your story is showing when hard things happen, it's not the end. It's it's We all go through hard things and often they're pivots. And what I've noticed in my life too, because I didn't start getting into food until my 40s, I didn't start podcasting till my 50s. There's so much to you. It doesn't have to be pigeonholed into one career that you do the rest of your life. Or, yeah. what, you know, we have different seasons. We have all our highs and lows. And that's what I feel like your story is showing. You've done things that you did not plan or ask or imagine. And you're yes. seeing joy come out of those things. So I totally resonate with that and you know you're doing all this food writing at any point did you actually take culinary classes are you self-taught i am self-taught i've been to kitchens i've been to you know i've spent time i now spend time if i go to one of the hotel kitchens like the montage or to something like that i spend time but what i've got to do now is you know i take a sous chef she will go into the kitchens because I can't spend time in that. I've got to spend it with the people who were there. The, right. You know, yeah. So I've got to spend it with them because I'm now on television. So because of that, they want to spend me to spend time there. But I will be demoing on stage. So there's lots of different ways I've learned cooking. And here's the other thing. Of course, culinary school, culinary, those are fantastic. It was at a college and they, you know, um, wanted me to go and speak to the um, to the culinary school. And so I told them, and in fact, I told them all these different roles that my career had taken. And when I talked to them about it, they're all going, oh, we had no idea because they're 18, 19. They're going, oh, I didn't know we could write this. And I'm I'm actually a good writer. And oh, can, and people coming up and talking to me later. So I was doing that. So your journey again takes on a load of things and mine the culinary side of it was a bit later you know some people had it earlier and they were great and they're fantastic some but and i had mine later um, but when i have it now you know i can i can cook right that's the yeah i can i'm um, you know whatever anybody says about me i can cook again your life is not just eating food and traveling but you actually have done a lot of work for those experiencing hunger and injustice. Maybe you could share a little oh. bit more about that charity work. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been working for, I work for a lot of charities and I work for a lot of uh, nonprofits. And I know that I'm not necessarily going to be the person who can bring in lots of donors I, and so i went back again and we did another event for them the next year and that was fantastic and i said let me bring from this point could i bring in some of the people from the food network and that's what i could do i could bring in people from so you know we we mentioned Monique, but scott conan jeffrey zakarian you know um alex guanacelli uh guy fieri bobby flay um, and they all come in and the interesting thing is these people, they're really good people. I mean, they're all very, very, very kind. And they're sitting there and they're thinking, I had no idea this company you know, was there. And they realize how much money they, this company makes and how little of that they spend on overheads, very little. And then the rest of it goes disaster relief anywhere in the world, including the US. It goes to women's empowerment, which is one of my favorites, everywhere in the world that they go and operate. It goes to uh, uh, children's hunger. 
which is just uh, so bad right now. You know, and it was, oddly enough, it was beginning to shrink and go down a bit. And then we had the pandemic and then everyone. And then it goes to agricultural development. And what they do, and this is why they're so special, they go into this place, they'll deal with it, you know, deal with the, but what they leave behind is teaching the the people there, the you know, the people of that nation, how it works, why it works. And then they might keep an eye on it just from the side, but they'll let them get on with it, which is so hard in this world now. But I'm not, I support a few sort of charities of this type. So that's so great that they are doing that kind of work. I think what speaks loudly is when people see faith in action, taking care of people and loving people. And so it's great that this work is being done. You know, I did one in, uh, I worked in Texacana for a food bank just to go, when I did my last book. And I went there and they said the only food you could find in 50 miles was one of these Dollar stores. Store. Yeah. And I was like, that's I, it's horrible for that to be able to happen and it's usually i have to say the mother who has to go and get you know this great you know food that and she said i remember talking to one woman and she said i come here and either a church bank or a food bank or anything like that i'll get some food which usually has to be dried food because that's how they keep it or I've got to drive 50 miles to go and find any food. And she goes, I don't think my car can make 50 miles. That's yeah. the thing. And I, and I, because you don't realize that people there are struggling, you know, and that's what we go and help them with. They, they're either may have their money to pay for drugs or it goes on rent and they have to decide or it goes on food and they've got, four kids or they've got two kids whatever it is and if they spend it on one this month they have to spend it on the next next month and try and pay a little bit of their rent or they need to spend it from food and you're just going this is horrible it's and so particularly being in the united states we have too much food mm -hmm. i'm getting really angry about this we have too much food and yet we throw away nearly 40 percent of our food we throw away nearly 40% of our food. It makes me so angry. But if you can go in and go agricultural development, this will help. Yep. Or food, if you go to a garden and you have this garden across the community and the people from this communities aren't stupid. They know, they know what's happening to them and they, but they, they don't, they're caught in this loop. Now that's your heart of justice coming out. That's that's the God in you coming out of like anger against the injustices. Um, so one of my, so I work as a personal chef. I do private dinner, things like that. But this is my next thing is uh, developing a community garden and developing cooking classes for children to relearn yeah. what is a vegetable? What is a zucchini? <laughs> what can you do with it? Because you can give them a zucchini, but they don't know what to do with it, and they'll yeah. throw it out anyway. So that's my long-term goal. It's not going to be... Well, that's great. But that's, yeah, because as I've met so many people in the culinary world, because I had the privilege of working at CHOP, the, the thing people say when you cook good food is like, oh, when are you going to open your restaurant? Then I like, never do a brick and mortar. Yeah. Blessings to those who do. Thank you for doing that so I have a place to go and eat, but I won't do it. But then I was like, I think this is what I'm supposed to do is like coordinate these classes to re-educate children here so that they love whole foods, like not out of box, not in a can. So yeah, so when I heard about your work, I'm like, oh, that's amazing because that's literally what I feel like why I'm supposed to be here in the season and have all these connections. And uh, you know, if you ask me, even this year, we've probably done what are we, 20 events or something this year. And I preferred, I uh, so rather prefer, I love to do those uh, events. And to be honest, I love doing the Food Network. It's, of course, that's great. I absolutely adore it. 
but I, I'm doing that because it leads to the others. Right, that's it gives you a platform. The, that's the thing. Yeah, that's the platform, and that's what I enjoy. Yeah, no, that's that's amazing. Yeah, I loved working for Chopped and Food Network, and I've done other productions, and it's been great to see that side of the world. And But then, you know, people come to me in my regular world. They're like, is it really true that they only have that many minutes on the clock? Is it really true? Yeah. And they I'm like, <laughs> it's really true. It is it is a real competition. It's like legal, oh, yeah, it's you a, have to do it. I know when I do, you know, guys' grocery games or anything like that, it's real. And trust me, it's real. <laughs> yes. And I work on the uh, culinary side and the uh, culinary production team. And it's a lot of work to, so like, getting the pantry ready for the contestants. It's a lot of work and people don't realize it. Um, but I watched Guys Grocery Games. I'm like, oh my word, I don't know if I'd ever, I know some people that have worked on that one. I'm like, I don't think I could, that's, that's a huge pantry right there, that that grocery store. No, no, but it's, that's a great. Um, to wind things down, one of the thing, questions I ask people on this show, uh, do you own a curry leaf plant? No, now, but that's an interesting one because predominantly I cook from Northern India mm -hmm. or from the UK. So I don't have a curry plant, but I live very, very, very close uh, to a store this way. It's about 20 minutes away or maybe less, in fact. And they keep curry leaves there. And so I go in and I'll buy a whole bunch of curry leaves if I'm going to do, uh, you know, using something that needs a curry leaf in it. Trying to explain to people that curry leaf doesn't mean everything you add it to is a curry is really hard. Yeah. In this country, what I've seen, um, people who are trying to get back to their uh, South Asian roots and identify more with it, because a lot of us who grew up here, and you maybe had this when you were growing up, we try to assimilate more into American culture and kind of minimize our Indianness to because we're American. I grew up in an Same Irish Italian yeah. Catholic neighborhood. So I, I tell people during the week I was American and on the weekends I was Indian doing, you know, <laughs> family gatherings and our Indian church gatherings. So then as everybody got older, the the mark of it seemed of someone really embracing one is you know how to make a uh, traditional chai or chaya or cha, depending on what language you're using and owning a curry plant, like nurturing an actual curry plant. So well, that's... Uh, it's interesting to see, like, if you, if you do those two things, you're, you're on your way to owning your identity in, as a South Asian. Uh, let me tell you something else from that then. So chai, and tea mean the same thing. So interestingly, so when you have chai, that was it all comes from China. And chai is one region of China uh, that comes from that, the chai plant. And that went uh, along that way. And it went through India and it, it was the land based. And you have tea, which went along the on the water, and that went to France. It went to Britain, so why, that's how we have tea. And so it's the same plant, but one goes along the land, one goes along the sea, and that's why we have different words for tea and chai, which I just think is really... So even in China, you'll have... Um, in uh, Russia, you'll have chai, but if you go along the... You know, through... Um, around the... Like through Cape, Lampa. Uh, the Cape of Good Hope or anywhere, that's when it's called tea. And I just... Again, I get so excited by that, which is maybe that's a little, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking for? A little kind of uh, nerdy, but <laughs> I just love that. I just um, love that. <laughs> yeah, no, I love everything about like the science of cooking and food and the history and, and how so many, everything we know about culture, it really is tied to food and agriculture and trade routes and all of those things. I love that when I talk about food. And yeah. that's where I'm different from, you know, the most of the people doing the demos. I said they can probably do food. In fact, they can do food a lot better than I can. 
but I can't do the history. So that's what I like to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do um, a one hour chai class. And in the class, I teach them how to make chai and I teach about spices, but I teach about colonization and um, language. So they walk away, taste, learning how to make it, tasting it, but they get the history behind it. And it's it, for people who are unfamiliar with South Asian food, it's kind of like the gateway food because they're learning about the spices. So I have them smell the cardamom and use the mortar and pestle. And uh, it's just a a great way. And honestly, this is a question I ask all my guests, but what is your beverage of choice? Because people assume, because I look like this, chai is my favorite drink, but it actually is British tea with cold milk and sugar in the raw which feels blasphemous to say, but I drink chai medicinally because all the ginger, you know, like the cloves, everything's like really healthy for you. So now in my advanced age, that's why I'm drinking chai. But if I wanted something to delight me, it would actually be British tea. (laughs) Well, again, now I don't drink sugar in mine. And again, this is a really fascinating one. In the north of England, where they had earthenware mugs and earthenware, they would always put the milk in first because if you poured the water in, it would it would explode. Mm. So what they, because it's boiling, I drink that, I'm watching TV or I'm working or doing anything, you know, and that is my perfect moment, drinking British tea, Taylor's Yorkshire Gold. Please try Taylor's Yorkshire Gold. It's amazing. And At the end of it, I'm sipping it right down to the last bit. And then I go, oh, this is the greatest. I I want another, but I don't want it then. I have it in the evening. And it is the best thing ever. So I would have my final meal would be fish and chips, haddock, curry sauce and mushy peas. (gasps) So lovely. And we call it curry sauce. There you go. That tells... But it's now with fish and chips, and it's only in the north of England, I believe. But um, but you pour that over the chips, and it's gorgeous. It's oh. And then you have your cup of tea and a bit of bread and butter on the side, and you just go, this is it. I'm, I'm, just that, I'm happy. And if, if God took me at that point, I'd be, and as long as it wasn't you know, painful or caused a heart attack or something, <laughs> But if he took me at that point, I'd be, and that was my life forever, eating fish and chips, curry sauce, mushy peas, and a pot of tea. I'd be as happy as Larry. I would. I'd be as, oh, oh. I'm very excited by that. <laughs> I, yeah, I love fish and chips. When I lived in London, that, especially this is in uh, 1990, 91. Um, as a poor college student, there's not a lot I could afford. So fish and chips was the only British food that I would eat. And I would go to Portobello Market and just get some zucchini. And then I would make that. And that would be like my meal at home. With I will tell you that London is at the moment is the greatest food city in the world right now. And I've been many, many times. It really is. And they're creating, and this is happening in America as well. Yes, we have Italian-American, but you're now getting American-Indian. Now, you haven't had that before in the U.S. because there wasn't enough people or they ate at home or they, but now you're beginning to go out and someone will go, well, some of the things that Manit does, you know, she'll do this burger, but with a you know, this dish or this dish or whatever, you know, and and in fact, I did like an Indian style because there's a, there's a guy who's just outside of Oxford, Mississippi. And that's it. And he follows me and I follow him. And um, so I went to get a few of the spices that I couldn't get anywhere. And I drove to go and meet him. And I said, and I said, do you mind? And he was like, no, no, no. I was going to do this. So I went and did it. And he goes, anything that helps British, um, uh, Indian food. That was about seven years ago now, I think. You need to go back. I mean, now he's a James Beard winner and he has a cookbook, but I just went to his restaurant last week. He did this amazing, I mean, his menu changes all the time, 
but think of like a hummus, but he doesn't even call it hummus, but made butter beans. And that was the base. And then he made this almost like a tarka, but with chopped peanuts and Indian spices and chopped masala and pour that on top. It was phenomenal. He is such good food. So yeah. And again, that's that is a dish that is coming from America that's using hummus, which is from the Mediterranean, and using uh, Indian ingredients to make that. And those are the things that I really love about what's happening in America, what's happening in Britain. As you have lived your life, you've made lots of bold choices. And some of them, you fell into it, but you still made the choice, right? You, you could have said no to Food Network or anybody else, but you said yes. What would you say to 18-year-old Simon based on what you know now? I Here's the thing. I probably wouldn't. And the reason I say that is I don't, I shouldn't tell him where his life's going to go. I should sh just let him go and live his life and mm -hmm. he could go and do anything. This life is a glorious surprise. Mm -hmm. It is. And that sometimes that can be good and bad. It can, but you've got to learn it all. You've got to try and explain. So, I wouldn't, is the honest answer. Other people have said that also, because there's something about the unknown that if you know, it kind of takes away. Is there something that you would like listeners to know if they are hesitant about making a bold move? If you make any bold move, it's going to take everything you've got. That's what it is. It's going to take everything you've got. Now, I was in a position where I was... Quite frankly, I was going to kill myself. So I had a choice. <laughs> I either killed myself or I went inside and I still have this uh, thing. I always say to myself, and this is one of my other um, um, kind of mantras, I was more hungry than suicidal. So I went back in to, to cook myself a life a life-saving doll. And... I think unless you're in that position, not necessarily that position you're going to kill yourself, but you're going to be in those positions, that's when you make the boldest decision. And and I had no idea that it was going to go on. I, I began writing for the newspapers because I did a blog. And then I started writing books because I wrote for the newspapers. Then I started uh, to travel around the world and write these books, even though I hadn't traveled much at that point, and I went around. But then I met my wife, who I thought I was never going to get married again. But I met her because I traveled around the world, and I moved to L.A. So all the areas are all bold decisions. But they're not. I was here, and I suddenly got to being on the Food Network. I, I didn't. I, uh, I went through all these changes to, to get to them. And that's the thing. Yeah, bold changes as well don't have to be the most bold in the world. So by, by doing these small uh, changes each time, they're all bold for me because I was giving up my job. I was, I was thinking, why aren't I in publishing anymore? And for the first two years or something, I was like, why aren't I in publishing? Where I was making a lot of money but I slowly got into it. And now I think, well, I'm making, quite frankly, more money than I was in publishing. These are all bold decisions. But yeah. how you get there is very different. Well, thank you so much for sharing your life with us and your stories. And it is <laughs> just such an honor to have you here. Well, please do keep in touch. It's been great talking to you. It has. And um, no, I really mean that. Do please keep in touch. And from what you're doing, you're doing a different area that I'm doing again. But we both came from a seminary and you're going, well, how did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's it's fantastic. It's been really, really fun. It has been really fun. And thanks for joining us for this episode of Being Brown and Bold. You can find us on YouTube on Instagram, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. We're so glad that you're joining us. If you want to follow Simon, 
he is on Simon at Simon Magender on his Instagram. He's got also his own website where he's got recipes and videos. So definitely check those out and check out his podcast, Eat the Globe. So thank you again. And I hope you will join us next time for another fabulous conversation. Till then, be wise and be bold.